Well, hello and good afternoon. My name is Ian Whitaker. I'm the Director of Strategic Content at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Uh, thank you to everyone and especially our members for joining us via Zoom for today's programme on COVID-19, a wake-up call for the West with John Micklethwaite, Adrian Woolridge and Anne Dias. Uh, before I hand you off to our moderator and panelists, please note that this program is on the record and that the Council is an independent and non-partisan platform and the views expressed by the, by the individuals we host are their own and do not represent institu institutional positions or views of the Council. Uh, finally, if you have a question for the panel, uh, we'll be taking your audience questions using our, our platform, our online platform. If you'd like to ask a question, simply answer uh, ccga.live directly into your browser. Uh, follow the on-screen prompts and you'll be able to submit or vote for your favourite question. Uh, so with that, uh, it's my pleasure to hand off to our moderator, Andreas, founder and chief executive officer of Aragon Global. Many thanks, Ian, and hello, everyone. My name is Andreas. I'm the founder and CEO of Aragon. I'd like to welcome our two panellists to the conversation. John Micklethwaite is the editor-in-chief of Bloomberg News, and while he's also held at The Economist prior to joining Bloomberg, I know John well, and we had many thought-provoking conversations and debates like the one we're about to have today. I also know Adrian, but through his writings, Adrian Woodridge is the political editor at The Economist. He's the man behind the Beijing column, and he lent his penmanship to the Schumpeter column for many years prior to that. John and Adrian are the authors of the excellent 2020 book, Wake Up Call, Why the Pandemic Has Exposed the Weaknesses of the West and How to Fix It. This is not their first book together. In prior volumes, they've also thought about the role of the state, the history of conservatism, which is an especially fertile ground for today's conversation. For those of you who haven't uh, gotten your hands on the book yet, um, you can request a copy of the book and I've arranged for a complimentary copy to be distributed for those of you who would like it uh, uh, to be picked up and, and the council will organize all of that uh, for you. So let's dive in. John, it would be great if we could start this chat by having you tell us what the book is about and also why you decided to write it together with Adrian. Well, firstly, thank you. Um, thank you, Anne. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, the council. It's a great delight to be back here in a, in a different, albeit a virtual setting. And thank you very much for having us. Um, I will, um, I will, yes, I will tell you what it's about. The basic idea of the wake up call is that it has two big sort of ideas running through it. And the first is that the COVID crisis was like an examination of government. It showed that government really mattered. This was the time when government was actually the difference between living and dying. And one really easy way to look at that is just to look at the statistics. Um, I just checked again this morning, the United States and Britain heading up to around 680 deaths for every million people. Um, you go to Germany, around 100 deaths for every million, 120 in fact. That's still six times better than the US or Britain. You go out to Asia, you go to places like Singapore, Taiwan, um, the, the Japan, South Korea, they're around 50 or 60 deaths for every million people. Those are 20, 30 times better. And so from our point of view, that was the first sort of great lesson. It has made a huge difference what kind of government you've had, how well you've done. And the second big lesson of the book is to look at one particular number, China. China claims a number of just three deaths for every million people. Now, we probably don't think that's very true, but imagine they're lying and they're hiding 90% of all their deaths. That would still put them up to around 30 deaths that would still make them 20 times better than America. And that for us is the second part of the wake up call. The, the book looks, it's a short, you're a punchy book, but it takes you all the way back to 1500, 1600 to begin with, when China was clearly the center of the world. And what happened after that was the West got better by being really good at government. You know, we fought against each other when the Chinese invented gunpowder, they used it for entertainment. We used it to blow each other out of the water. And by the 1960s, having jumping a long way ahead, um, America was dreaming of putting a man on the moon whilst millions of people, Chinese were sadly dying of starvation. And in a sense, that was when the West was at its peak. And what we worry about now is that China is coming back. And purely on the basis that China has done better at this examination than America has, I think people may draw the wrong lesson of it. But the underlying point is unless the West reacts to this, 
and regardless of whether you've got Trump or not, unless the West reacts to this, then we're looking at a sort of Sinocentric world ahead. And so this book is also a warning about that, that history comes in tides, and this exam particularly shows that. Thank you, John. Nadine, one of the things that comes through in your book is that the quality of governance and government matters. I was shocked last week to see images coming from China during Golden Week, during which everyone was working, shopping, traveling, having fun and being free in a way that is still very elusive for us in the US and even more so in Europe. In your words, Adrian, the West has failed and the East has adopted and adopted a better approach. Can you explain when that took place and what the roots of this are? Absolutely. I mean, we may well be coming to the end of the Trump era with the election that's coming, coming along uh, in, in the next uh, a week on Tuesday. But what really haunts us in this book is the question of whether we're actually coming to the end of the American era, the era that was really dominated by the United States and more generally by the West. Uh, and we may well look back on this year as a year that was remarkable, not for the transition of power or non-transition of power, whatever happens in the election, but it was remarkable for the transition of power in the big global sense from the West to the East. It does look as though the East in general, and China in particular, has done better at dealing with COVID than we have. And that as a result of doing better uh, at dealing with COVID than we have, they are pulling out of this massive global recession much earlier than we have. And I think that this is not just propaganda, what's going on in China. Um, I've talked to numerous people who say, well, yes, basically things are back to normal. I mean, people living in Beijing and, and, and Wuhan province uh, and uh, Shanghai. Um, and if you look at the statistics at the, uh, in terms of the production of manufactured goods and exports, they're going back to normal. And it does look as though we are still, you know, caught up in the in the, the in the um, COVID recession. So I think that this is an extremely worrying thing for the West, um, and it's it's worrying both in the short term, in the sense that it demonstrates that China is pulling out, and other Asian countries are pulling out of, of the recession earlier than us, but also that they actually pulled ahead of us. In quite recognized. We all sort of had a sense that China and Asia more generally was doing extremely well economically. That's sort of been factored in. We knew that they were producing great new companies, that they were producing great new products, that they'd sort of made the leap forward economically. But what we've seen during the COVID crisis is that they've also been producing new government systems, that they've made a sort of leap forward in terms of the quality and capacity of their government. And what we've learned is they've done that much more, much more vigorously than we'd ever thought, and that they've really, in many ways, got ahead of us. If you look, for example, at the list of the world's smart cities, cities that are using the Internet of Things um, intelligently, that have got their uh, sewerage systems, that have got their lighting systems, that have got their road transportation systems linked up to the Internet so they can be managed smartly, Almost all of those cities are now in the Far East. If you fly from the United States, um, from uh, Kennedy Airport, for example, to any Asian airport, um, you know, uh, in, 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 in China or uh, Singapore or Korea, you're flying almost from a second world country to a first world country. It's an extraordinary feeling that you have. So over and over again, we're seeing more and more evidence that Asia is pulling ahead. And our argument in this book is that we can either sort of forget about this and continue with what, what since the 1960s has been a long decline, or we can wake up and begin to realize that we, we're, we're not owed the position of top dog, we're not owed the position of the country or the, the, the system that shapes the world, that we have to earn it. And that um, COVID has demonstrated that we're not earning it anymore. We don't have a government that really works as efficiently or effectively as we would like. So, I mean, that's in a nutshell is the, the warning, the wake up call that we're trying to sound in the book. Thank you, Adrian. Let's take a walk back through time to explain how the West has declined in governance and what has led to today's Western state, which you call the old fair state. Um, why is it that we are now organized in such an outdated way? 
Well, I think it's what's interesting really is that it, it's been a sort of story of a rise and fall. On the one hand, you know, the West for a long time had a monopoly of all the ideas about government. Um, you know, we were the people who came up with Thomas Hobbes, who would begin the book with John Stuart Mill, the Webbs, Locke, you've seen the effect of Thomas Paine, all those sort of people. Um, what's happened in the Western state pretty much since the 1960s is with the exception of you know what happened under Thatcher and Reagan, there has not been the same sort of renewal, the same sense of people looking at the state and trying to do it better. And one thing we do in the book is we, we detail all the different ways in which the Western state has managed to get both bigger and less efficient. And, and that isn't by coincidence. If you look at the private sector, you know, the private sector on the whole has got leaner. Um, it's all been about sort of smaller management. As Adrian said, the sort of ideas that you know, Asia borrowed ideas from the West and the private sector, and then the West reacted to those ideas. We saw that in cars. You know, the Toyota grabbed on the ideas of American theorists, and then people like General Motors and Chrysler and Ford came back and fought using those ideas as well. That just simply hasn't happened in government. And what happened there is that places like Singapore, particularly, Lee Kuan Yew grabbed on ideas in the West and both built a state which was smaller and more efficient. You, you talked about old fare. You know, basically, one of the things we do in the book is we, we look and we imagine what a, an American president might do if he came in. And we, some people have said that we, we should have chosen a modern woman like um, uh, um, uh, Angela Merkel or, or Hearn from um, New Zealand and blended those together, instead of which we reached into history and we pulled Abraham Lincoln and William Gladstone. And we put them together into a somewhat Frankenstein monster of President Bill Lincoln, who brings in all the sort of 19th century desire to reform the state. And one of the first things he would look at uh, in horror, and remember this is a man who could be both a liberal, both be a Democrat and a Republican. You know, he's someone who really wants to help the poor. That was the great crusade of both Gladstone and Lincoln. At the same token, he has a total horror of big government he has a particular horror of giving away money to rich people. Well, you look at the American state, vast amount, by most counts, somewhat over half, goes to the old. In many cases, that's justified, but in others, it isn't. I, I simply do not think it is right for Warren Buffett and Bruce Springsteen to collect money in terms of social security. In, this, in our version of what Bill Lincoln does, we do actually argue, argue for a universal health care system. But at the moment, you look at American, where the American money is spent, it goes to the old and the rich, the $1.6 trillion worth of tax exemptions, which would utterly horrify either Lincoln or Gladstone as reformers. And I think it's, there's a conspiracy in this, is that the Democrats are useless at um, reforming the public sector, that Republicans hide behind this mantra that the only answer of a state is to have a smaller state, but at the same time dole out all these kind of little perks to people. And what would happen with a really clean brush is it would come in and get rid of all those exemptions and also retarget it, retarget the state from the rich and in particular in America, the old, and target it properly towards the poor. That's a very tall order and, and maybe something to accomplish in decades <laughs> rather than years. Yet I'd like to focus it back on years. Um, you argue in the book that the underperformance of a state is not just due to a lousy set of leaders today in 2020, and you defend the idea by saying that the West has been too bad at governance for too long to blame it all on current leaders. Yet, one cannot um, one cannot um, always uh, uh, predict um, how history would have occurred. But do you think things could have been uh, differently in some countries uh, if they had been led by different leaders? I think that the quality of leadership matters. Obviously, people such as Reagan and even more Mrs. Thatcher made a huge historical difference. JFK made a huge historical difference. Uh, and of course, Churchill made a huge historical difference. So I don't think we can discount the role of leaders entirely. But leaders aren't everything. I think there are a number of people who think that if we replace Donald Trump with a new president, everything will be fine again. Or if we replace Boris Johnson with a new prime minister, everything will be fine again. But I think there are two objections to this. One, that leaders are, in, in, in a sense, symbols as much as they are anything else. They're symbols of broader things that have gone wrong. If you look at the American healthcare system, which has coped extremely badly with the crisis because there is not a sufficiently um, successful public health system, that's not something that Donald Trump 
created. That's something that's been there since at least the Second World War. Uh, it's a problem that has dogged Americans all the way through. Amer the American system you know, is geared to, to giving healthcare to older, richer people. It's, fee for, it's a fee-for-service business that's just not very good at dealing with things like pandemics. That's a structural problem. That's not a Donald Trump problem. If you look at some of the failures of communication between the federal government and the state system, that's something that's been developing for a, uh, a long time. The paralysis of the American political system of the center in particular is something of which Donald Trump is a symbol, as, as a symptom rather than a cause. Um, and I think that the educational problems which you've been having for a long time, the failure of the school system to generate really world-class results is a structural thing. It's not a Donald Trump thing. It's because you have a teachers, teachers unions which are overpowerful because it's almost impossible to sack um, ineffective teachers. And it's also impossible to reward really good teachers with fast tracks, with, with, with very good systems of remuneration. So there are all sorts of structural problems there. Also, and on a sort of deeper level, I think there's a problem not just with the particular leaders you've got, but with the quality of the leadership class, that you're just not getting good enough people to go into government. And that's something that's you know, changed since the 1960s. I just read a marvelous new biography of JFK, and JFK all through, you know, was brought up to go into public service. He was surrounded by people who wanted to go into public service, who came out of fighting for their country in the Second World War to go into public service to serve their country in a new way. That ethic has really declined in the last few years. Bright young people really want to go into private industry, into Silicon Valley or finance. They want to make their mark in the private sector, partly because the rewards are so much bigger, but partly because the ethic of sacrificing yourself for public service has been denigrated. Uh, the public sector has been denigrated. The notion of the public sector is for, for losers. It's not very dynamic. has had a corrosive effect on America. So I think the whole culture of leadership is something that needs to be really reinvigorated. We don't, we don't just need a better president. Uh, we talk about Bill Lincoln as being our ideal uh, sort of cos uh, composite president. We need a better leadership class. And to do that, we need uh, a culture and a set of incentives that are different from today's. Thank you, Adrian. I, uh, I think I can't um, not ask about um, what you think of enlightened autocracies uh, one argument that, that's emerged uh, through the book, but also outside, is, is that these enlightened autocracies are better at dealing with major issues than democracies when there's an urgency and when there's a sense uh, that you need to marshal resources very quickly. Um, you know, la last week, um, there was a, a case of, of COVID that appeared in, in a region of uh, China. It was a Friday, and by Monday, 4.5 million people had been tested. So is there... Um, is there truth to this argument uh, that uh, enlightened autocracies by nature will be in the future better to deal with such natural catastrophes and other challenges of our time? Well, the, the answer to that is kind of enlightened autocracy is, yeah, they have to be pretty enlightened. I mean, we, one of the reasons to write the book is, I think perhaps relatively early, we spotted the, the gap between the Chinese and the American performance in this is so gigantic. And again, you know, we can argue about whether this number is precisely correct, but the margins of error, I mean, in your business or in, or in mine, if somebody else is like 10 or 20% better than you, that is a disaster that you will never catch up. In this particular case, you're looking at people being 20 or 30 times better at protecting their citizens. Um, and the false positive we thought people would draw, and that they are beginning to draw it, is that they will look at the performance of China, of China and America, and they will say, actually, yes, okay, given that, surely that means that enlightened autocracies are better. In fact, you look at the numbers, and that's not true. Um, what, it's certainly true that China did better than America. What, what, what is not true is you look around the world, most of the countries that have done well have been democracies. And you look at, we mentioned some at the beginning, you've got Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, You've got South Korea, Taiwan. I accept that you know, Singapore has one or two authoritarian leanings, but really at core it's still a democracy and so on and so on and so on. By contrast, the autocracies, you know, Russia hasn't done particularly well at this. You want to go to any of the Stans, you're not going to do terribly well. Iran hasn't done well. Um, you visit North Korea. I don't think I would particularly recommend that if you had COVID. So by most measures, they haven't. The point you're getting at, which actually is, is, is right, 
is that you would sort of expect autocracies to be good at dealing with this. You know, it's the one time when you need to compel people to do things. But actually, there's, you know, the thing we looked, the more we looked at it, most of the things that involve you know, being good at this have nothing really to do with autocracy. Um, just to use one example, you know, look, look, just take London, New York, and Seoul. They're three big cities. Um, in fact, Seoul is just a little bit bigger. The South Korean capital is just a little bit bigger than London or, or New York. Well, you now look at the, the casualties. New York's lost over 25,000 people or certainly over 20,000 people. London's lost 6,000. Seoul has lost 60, 60. Now, immediately you can start saying, well, that's because the A is a much more kind of consensual culture. Rubbish. Um, I'm sure most of the people on this call have been to watch Parasite. Uh, South Korea is the home of some of the world's biggest nightclubs. Um, most of the children of the people on this call are listening to K-pop the whole time. This is a chaotic, vibrant, somewhat crazy city with subways, crowded streets, everything you would expect with COVID. But they managed to put testing in and they managed to just do it in a rational, clever way. And that's something that we completely failed at. So the the basic answers in many of these cases are nothing to do with autocracy. We, we mentioned education earlier. Yes, Singapore is a bit sterner. Yes, um, but it hasn't spent more money on technology than other people. It simply did a really complicated, amazingly difficult thing was it decided to pay good teachers more and get rid of bad teachers. And it's the same throughout the whole system. It pays the head of its civil service over a million dollars a year. American Republicans would never tolerate that. And they're stupid to do that. They should they should think about rewarding people in the public sector more. By contrast, Democrats would never allow bad teachers to be sacked. And that, in essence, is a problem. So if you look at the around the world, it isn't really an autocracy versus democracy argument. But a large part of it, yeah, at the margin, there are definitely some things. I'm not trying to argue against you there. But there, it's really at the margin. The main things to do with this is simply to do with competence, taking government seriously, people having trust in it. The government's making sensible decisions. The, the list of governments that failed this test, it was an examination. It's just like when you have pupils. Um, if, if you were a teacher and you suddenly set an examination, you would pretty much guess who would be useless at it. Um, and America was one of the places you would have guessed would be useless at it, given the fact that it's got a healthcare system, which as we said, is aimed at the old and the rich rather than the poor. By contrast, you would almost certainly have guessed that the Nordics and, and places like Singapore would do well. You would perhaps be surprised that Greece did so well, perhaps surprised that Vietnam is so much better than America. And you might be surprised that actually Singapore didn't do even better than it did. But, but basically, this is something that has been coming for a long time. It's not to do with autocracy, it's to do with competence. Let's uh, switch gears for a second. And I'd like to ask you about uh, what your prescriptions are for this problem. You're arguing that the West doesn't need more government, it needs better government. So to tell us how you see um, how conservatism, which is another subject that you've addressed in the past, uh, both in books and in articles, how does conservatism come to terms with its own failures and renew its missions to have free markets, free people, free countries? I think this, this COVID crisis has been a massive crisis for conservatives in particular, um, because um, the two countries that have done signally badly during this crisis, the United States and Britain, um, both have conservative leaders of a populist tinge. Um, and we have to ask very difficult questions, not just about whether these particular leaders made mistakes, but whether the conservative movement in general has um, failed to grasp the question of government. And we think that in one important way that it has, that the conservative message since the rise of Reagan and Thatcher is that government is the problem rather than the solution. Um, and you know, re remember Ronald Reagan's great statement that the most terrifying words in the English language are, I am from the government and I'm here to help. And that was a correct reaction against the over expansion, the bloating of government in the 1970s. But it became a sort of mantra that became less and less productive. We cut back, we associated government just with bloat, just with something that was unnecessary. Tax cutting became a sort of religion on Capitol Hill amongst the Republicans, that the denigration of government became something that was ritualistic amongst Republicans, and we cut back too far. Uh, and I think what we have to recognize is that government actually really matters. It is the difference between uh, life and death. 
during a pandemic. That's it's the basis of a civilized and successful society. So we need to cut back, but not cut back too much. So I think what this crisis taught us above all is that conservatism needs to, rec to reconcile itself with governments. It needs to realize that government matters and it needs to bring some classical uh, conservative principles uh, to bear on reconstructing government, that we need to be willing to pay good people enough money, that we need to make sure that the system is uh, focused, not sprawling. We need to get rid of this whole notion of making tax loopholes and subsidies for the rich. That's appalling for, from any principle, but certainly a conservative set of principles. Uh, and we need to build resilience into the system. Uh, and we need to recognize that the first duty of any country is to protect its citizens from unnecessary harm, whether it's unnecessary harm that comes uh, from foreign powers attacking you, or it's unnecessary harm from people dying through lack of medical care. So we would say a new conservatism would, would ought to be willing to embrace even a much bigger public health system, which I know that conservatives in America are very worried about, but I think it fits in with with conservative philosophy. So we would argue for a new source of conservatism, which we would call, you know, not quite big government conservatism, but smart government conservatism or wise government conservatism. And actually, if you look at the history of conservative thought or broadly conservative thought, it, it is, you know, very friendly to this idea. If you look at, if you look at Plato, he was talking about the importance of having a guardian class of people who are committed to government. If you look at uh, Edmund Burke, he was saying that you must have uh, people who will take the long view of the health of society, who are willing, who are willing to reject populism in favour of wise leadership. I think we need to go back to those those great thinkers, um, and shift the direction of conservatism towards an embrace of good government. Can I, can I just add one thing there? Is, is the, the thing, this, this book, um, which you so generously um, brought all the people on this call, uh, you know, the, the point of it, we, we don't hang back from criticizing Trump's um, and Johnson's and other leaders' um, responses, and they definitely made mistakes. I think you know, Trump took far too long to take this seriously. He treated it the wrong way. He did a whole variety of, of strange things that made it worse, but it didn't change the fundamental system underneath it. And that, that's, that's really the point. And so it's much, it's much sort of deeper than just that. We'd also fault Trump very, very much for this being the first, I think the first real global crisis since the Second World War, where America has not been the leader. Um, it's, it's difficult to exaggerate, but you know, I'm in London at the moment. It's difficult to exaggerate the lack of leadership of the West at the moment, that, that, that if you purely sit in front of the, the West and say that your policy is America first, um, that is not a way to unite Europe, let alone the democracies of Asia behind it. And the tragedy in this, to us at least, is you look at, and, and this is something which conservatives certainly should appreciate, is that Trump identified a problem, which was China, but he has not understood how you win these sort of coldish wars. You, you win them by getting allies behind you and by having a message that transfers. And it has wholly failed to get Europe behind um, the rest of the, behind America in this quest. And particularly this idea of not kind of talking about freedom and liberty and always talking about America first, that does not work in Indonesia. That does not work in Singapore. It does not work in Japan, Korea, all these places which should be natural allies of both the United States and Europe. Anyway, just another point to add. I'd like to leave some time for questions by our attendees, but perhaps I could throw in one last question, a personal one. How have you spent your time in lockdown? And tell us about something good that came out of it. Um, you let, me, let me go first. Unfortunately, we spent quite a lot of our time in right. lockdown writing this book which is a, a, a slightly exotic use of, uh, of one's lockdown time. But we, we did, I think, general find that if you're not commuting, either within your country or across the Atlantic, you do have a certain amount of time which you can use for um, purposes such as, such as writing books. We also write, wrote the book, not just because we had spare time, but because we were really, really struck by how disappointing um, the, the, the West had been in, in responding. And we took that as a symbol of something that's, that's much deeper. It's not just a particular crisis, but it's something that really sums up a failure over many, many several decades to, to, to deal with problems. Also, one of the things we noticed, we, we both 
live part of the time, at least, in the countrysides. And one of the things that we sort of independently noticed was that if you wander around the English countryside, you see a series of monuments uh, in churchyards, which are rather romantic places to visit, but you see these monuments which have the list of the dead. And if you look at people who were killed in the First World War, uh, in particular, you see that it includes everybody in the local community. It's not just the local uh, uh, poacher or the local builder, it's the local squire. Everybody sacrificed themselves for, for their community. And then we looked at what was happening during this crisis and we saw a much more divided society in which you know the, the, the rich are doing quite well during the pandemic because they can work from home. Uh, they can summon everything they want from Amazon, whereas the poor uh, are bearing a lot more of the crisis. And that sort of symbolizes a rising inequality in society, but also a rising lack of communal commitment. So one of the many arguments that we come to be advocating in this book is that we ought to have a, a new version of national service, uh, not a military national service, but a civic national service. So all sorts of people from different backgrounds and different classes come together to work for the government for a period of time, but also that the government ought to give sort of scholarships, full freight scholarships for poorer people to go to university on condition that they actually do a few years of nationals, national service. These are not of national service, of working for the government, of working for the civil service, particularly in, 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 if, if they're trained in technology. These are all ways of sort of reconnecting the government with the life of the nation and reconnecting the nation with government service, this fragmentation um, of society into, into classes that don't have very much to do with each other. And this notion that government really is something over there that we don't want to engage with, I think it's profoundly, profoundly dangerous. Thank you. I'm going to switch over to some questions that were asked by our attendees. And perhaps as a good segue to the first one, this notion of reconnecting uh, with the state and government and institutions. One of our attendees is asking, how can a country reinstill faith in its institutions? If COVID-19 didn't do that, then what could? Well, it's a mixture, isn't it? Um, it there's a great deal of chicken and egg in this, um, the, the, if, if you pardon the metaphor, but the, you know, the, very, the very basic line is that, and France indeed is an example of this, France has unbelievably low levels of trust in government, um, which, may, which makes it very hard for government to persuade people to do anything, as, as you know. But there, the same is you look at the numbers and it goes slightly back to what Adrian was just talking about. Just look at the numbers of American trust in government. You know, when we talked about the 1960s, you know, like many other people who look at history a lot, you know, we thought, well, maybe the high point of the West um, in terms of government was the sort of fall of the Berlin Wall when everything seemed to be going its direction. What's interesting, if you look at the, the mechanics, the internal workings of government, it began much earlier. And one thing about the 1960s is that was the last time when you found sort of three quarters of Americans trusting their government. And you also found on top of it, tying exactly into what Adrian's just been saying, is that was the last time pretty much when, you know, you expected the best and the brightest to go and do a turn in, in Washington or to go and do a turn in Whitehall here. That's just gone. All the smart, clever people like you <laughs> go into the go into the private sector, and that is where the the money is and where the opportunities are. So a lot of it is to do with getting pulling people back into the public sector and reinvigorating it. Now, your your question is absolutely right. This is this is not something that you can immediately pull together. And, and one of the great lessons for politics in this, I think, is that you can lose trust. I think Donald Trump lost a lot of trust with all his somewhat bizarre statements about injecting yourself with bleach and so on. Britain is actually weirdly quite interesting in this respect. What happened was that Boris Johnson took a very divided sort of brexit -y country. And to begin with, at least, um, the country did unite very heavily in a kind of blitz-like spirit about it. But then he threw that all the way, or one of his advisors threw that all the way by taking a, um, Dominic Cummings, his sort of closest advisor, took what we described as a very unauthorized and unorthodox sort of road trip, um, breaking every available law and claiming he was doing it to test his eyesight. And under normal circumstances, you'd have expected him to be sacked. He wasn't. And the result was that everybody, even kind of Tory papers, began to lose faith in it. So, you know, the COVID has been a chance to win trust. And, and some people, Angela Merkel's a good example, Jacinda Hearn's another example of people who've sort of used it to rally it, but other people have lost it. 
Thank you. I um, want to stay on the topic of institutions and trust. Um, there's a, a number of uh, people are asking this question in different ways. What is the single most important political institution for combating COVID-19? Where should we place the emphasis? The single most important political institution? Well, in Britain, um, it's the National Health Service, which has uh, done a reasonably good job, not a brilliant job, but a reasonably good job of coping with a very unexpected you know, surge in demand. I think in, the, in, in Germany, you have an even better national health service because it tend, it's much more local than the British one. So it's responded on a much more local basis. And I think the biggest problem with the United States in terms of its response has been the lack of an integrated public health system. As I said earlier, that if you have a system that's driven by fee-for-service medicine, it will inevitably look after the old uh, and focus on elective surgery, and it won't do enough to look after public health. And the simple fact of a pandemic like this is it's something that is communicated you know, by the public, and uh, not something that can be prevented, uh, that the rich can't buy their way out of this. You know, it's there in the air that we breathe. So a public health system is vital. I think we should just very quickly to add on that, you know, the reason why we support a public health system is two reasons. Um, one is we think it's wrong for a country as rich as America. I was looking at pictures yesterday in Arizona of people lying in the street with COVID. It's, it's just wrong. We think morally wrong not to be able to provide sort of health care to people, especially at these sort of times. But secondly, um, it's because we actually think a proper, properly constructed public health care system would be much cheaper yeah. The, the horrible secret of America, which is uh, the insurance companies and things try to hide, you spend more money on public health care than just about everywhere. I mean, and I'm saying public health care, you spend way, way more money once you include private health care. But even on the public health care, America spends more money than Sweden. So you already have a much more communist, overregulated, <laughs> crazily um, sort of socialist in many ways system because it's so complicated. Yeah, make it much simpler. Follow the journey. We we had, one of the things we do in the book with Bill Lincoln is we tell him go off and reform things. But and this is the crucial bit, and this is a reason that should give people on this call hope. We just say reform it using what's worked elsewhere. In the same way as you would, if you saw another fund doing better than you in South Korea, you might borrow the, the tactic. Just just do what's worked elsewhere in healthcare. Places like Germany, Singapore, even Canada are, are just better. Of providing public health care in America, borrow it, and your private health care system will survive as it does everywhere else as well. And at the moment, it's just a question of a big lobby, and a lot of people are getting hurt because of it. I think Let's um, switch to China. Oh, sorry, sorry, Adrian, go ahead. Carry on. I was just going to say, if I was going to recommend a new institution that America could create, I would recommend uh, an institution whose sole job is to look at what works in other countries study it and think about how it can be applied to the United States. We used to, America used to pride itself on treating its states as laboratories of democracy, but now we ought to be treating the whole world as a succession of laboratories of democracy. And somebody should be sitting there in Washington saying, who can we learn from? What ideas can we see, steal and seize and implement in the government system? That's a brilliant thought. And, and I, uh, I, I suggest uh, that uh, every country should have that, not just America. Um, let's switch back to China because a number of the attendees um, have questions about where you see uh, this long-term equilibrium in China. One attendee uh, in particular is, is asking, could we project out how a government like China will fail or prosper as their actions have again become more troublesome? They're winning now, but won't they just have different problems than the West? Yeah, despite I their seemingly good governance today? Yeah, we do, this, the aim of this the aim of this book, which I can show you here, is to is to, to is to um, is to prepare, tell the West to wake up and start kind of preparing. And, and and but it is not a kind of hymn of praise to China by any means. Just to be really clear, we think China did a very bad job again. Things wrong with autocracies in dealing with the disease at the very beginning. Um, it did better with it then learned more quickly because it did much better with. COVID than it did SARS, both in terms of reacting to it and telling the rest of the world about it. But it, it, didn't, it wasn't perfect by any means. You're, you're, the questioner is right that China does have real problems. It's got a middle class that is kind of growing in power, it's less likely to take some of the autocratic things, um, we say. There, there, there are problems, obviously, to do with corruption, all these many, many things, which we do, we do mention and deal with. 
And they're long, although they look at places like Singapore and they are, I think, trying to borrow what they see as the best bits of it, there are real problems inside China. But, and I think this is something that we should watch, is I, the, the basic thing is when you look at things like education, they are beginning to implement, they're beginning to copy what works in other places. And no. you can see the education ranking. China is going up those. Yeah, there's a degree of cheating in that. And they, they tend to use Shanghai and Beijing rather than the whole country. And there are parts of China which are way behind, but they are doing better and they're keeping doing better. And then again, again it's a bit like the airports. You go there and look. One, one, one rather strange example, which gives some, shed some light on this, in Shanghai, if you get into a subway car, um, you it will tell you um, if somebody catches COVID in that, they'll, they'll get hold of you afterwards and say, you were on this subway car at this precise time because you had to show your mobile phone when you get in. Now, you can interpret that in two different ways. You can say, one, oh, what a terrible invasion of privacy. And many of us might not like that. But the basic fact is it's sort of irrelevant in the Western, most Western countries, certainly the United States, because you can't do that anyway. There's no subway systems are so old. So without any kind of, you know, I was, in, as you know, live in New York, there, there is no sign of, you know, the, the idea of a metro card being anything compatible to the sort of things that you could find in Asia. It's miles behind. So it's not really the question of privacy doesn't really come into it. We couldn't do that anyway. And so the point is, I, I would just counsel, yes, China has problems. It's sort of demographic problems. It's got a problem of a rising kind of bourgeoisie who may not be as, um, as, as keen on some of the things to do with autocracies before. But the idea that they're just automatically going to come apart when they keep on putting more effort into government than us, we think that's a worrying idea. Never, never underestimate your competitors. The um, the readers uh, and the listeners also have an additional question on China, and that's to do with the rising standards of living in China, which have not been accompanied uh, by intense demands for political liberalization. Why hasn't this happened? Or maybe we haven't heard about it, but do you have any thoughts on that? Well, there's a great deal of suppression going on. Um, there's a great deal of fear going on. You have a, an authoritarian regime that monitors its people, um, that has sources of information on its people that no authoritarian regime in the history of the world has ever had before. And that's sure to suppress a lot of um, political discontent. But I also think that if you've been as poor as the Chinese have been for a very, very long time, you know, we can go back, we talked earlier, John talked earlier about the 1960s, that was an era of massive um, poverty, of starvation. Um, in, in China, you know, they've made such an extraordinary leap forward in basic living standards over the past uh, few decades since the opening up in the, in, in, in the 1980s. Such a massive leap forward that a lot of people are just happy to, 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 to you know, to, to, to have that degree of prosperity. They're living in a, in, a, in a prosperous consumer society where they've got access to things that they could never have, that their parents would never have dreamed of. So I don't think it's the first thing on their, on their wish list. And if you look at uh, countries such as Singapore, it's possible co to conceive of a sort of modernization which doesn't put as much of a premium on individual liberty and political representation as our own version of modernization. That's, I put a lot of caveats to that because we're not, you know, there is a lot of suppression going on, but it's, it's possible that, 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 you know, they're actually reasonably content not the Uyghurs, obviously the Uyghurs, obviously lots of people are excluded from that, but the people who are living and prospering in Shanghai and Beijing are thinking, we've never had it so good. The other, the other thing to add to that very quickly is that, you know, really obviously they, they're, they're looking at what's happening to the West with COVID and that is helping them. There was a, um, Tom Friedman wrote a, a column about our book in the New York Times where he imagines the Politburo watching the last debate and daring each other um, to drink a glass of whiskey every time that Donald Trump said something stupid. And every time um, and he imagined that they would be paralytic <laughs> within about 20 minutes. If, from the Chinese regime's point of view, the fact that, um, um, that, 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 that the West has done so badly, that has given its citizens another reason to, to sort of reconsider these things. So, it, you know, again, the, the whole point of our, you know, calling our book the wake up call is to tell the West, you know, you wake up. And then actually you get a very positive circle. You know, you, if, if the West begins to get much better at government again, doesn't just rely on the private sector, 
what happens then is that, yes, the democracies of Asia begin to rally to the West. And beyond that, you know, the people of China think, well, that's what we want. At the moment, it's a harder argument to make. One of the things... Oh, we... a... Go ahead, Adrian. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, I keep interrupting. But it was one of the points that we try and make in this book is that, that the COVID crisis could have been China's Chernobyl because it, obviously because it started there and because their initial response to COVID was appallingly cack-handed. But it ended up being the West's Waterloo. The West, particularly Britain and America, the people who did badly in terms of handling the crisis, the Chinese did better than they did. And also we did not look um, at the international dimension, particularly the United States didn't look at the international dimension. So the, the China has used this actually to project its soft power to say, look, we're the guys who can deal with this sort of thing. We're the guys who can govern institutions. They've increased their involvement with the World Health Organization, increased their involvement with the United Nations and other such institutions at precisely the time when the West or I should say the United States, has been retreating from the, those organizations. So I think, you know, in so many ways, this year will be looked at potentially as a turning point in which China began to exercise more influence in the world, demonstrated its capacity to deal with the shock better than the, than the United States, and the balance of power could be fundamentally shifting. I hope it isn't, but it could well be fundamentally shifting away from the United States, and we could be moving towards the Sinocentric world. Adrian, what a great wrap up to end our talk. I'm afraid we're out of time for questions. I do have one admonishment, though, from a listener, and that is um, an idea for your next book. Uh, one of the uh, attendees is asking if you could please revisit your book, The Right Nation, with an updated version covering the Tea Party, Trump, QAnon, etc. So uh, some food for thought and perhaps for another discussion in front of the council um, in the next uh, volume that you'll produce together. Adrian and John, it's been such a pleasure to have you um, in the, uh, to have this live debate and conversation about the utmost, most important topics of our time today. Uh, thank you so much. And Ian, I'll pass it back to you to wrap up. Thank you very much, Snow. That's, uh, that's all good. Thank you for your time and thank you for joining us.